My soul cries out with a joyful shout that the God of my heart is great. And my spirit sings of the wondrous things that you bring to the ones who wait. You fix your sight on your servant's plight and my weakness you did not spurn. So from east to west shall my name be blessed could the world be about to turn my heart shall sing of the day you bring let the fires of your justice burn wipe away all tears for the dawn draws near and the world is about to And in a moment, we'll have Jen ringing our bell. and welcome to our Sunday morning worship service here at 30 Theodore Parker Church. My name is Katie Lee Crane, and I am a minister now retired who is happy to be mostly sitting in the pews, although today I'm delighted to be up here with you. Welcome to our first service back in the sanctuary since March 2020. Our staff and our worship leaders are delighted to bring you to this beloved space through the magic of Zoom and our new audio visual system. 
Many special thanks to Joel Needitz, who, who's operating the camera today. As this is our first service using the new technology, we hope you'll join us in the spirit of grace and good humor if we hit any snags. As we begin our service today, we want to acknowledge that our church was once built on the ancestral lands, unceded lands of the Massachusetts people. We acknowledge the devastating legacy of settler colonialism and the continuing harm done to indigenous groups in our community and beyond. May our commitment to justice, equity, and compassion call us to take meaningful, restorative action to honor and protect this land and all her people. We come together to recognize again and celebrate the gift of life for ourselves and for all the creatures with whom we share this planet for the miracle of every breath with wonder in our joys and compassion in our sorrows. We invite all of you to bring your perspectives, your beliefs and doubts, and all that is unique and wondrous about you to our service. In the spirit of love, all are welcome here. If you are new or visiting today, feel free to follow the link in the chat box to our administer, Alyssa Halliday, and leave us your contact information. You might like to sign up for weekly e-news, which Alyssa can help with. We also invite you to visit our website at tparkerchurch.org. An accessibility note. We are using Zoom's auto transcriptive feature to offer live captions as subtitles throughout today's service. While not perfect, they do, we hope, offer um, to make the service more accessible. If you're on a computer and would prefer not to see the captions, look to the button on Zoom's bottom menu that says live transcript, click that little upward facing arrow and select hide subtitle. If you miss something that was said during the service, you can also go to that menu and click read full transcript. We hope that each of you will find some comfort to carry with you throughout the week and some challenge for your thoughts. As always, we wish for each of you health, well being, and a sense of peace. Welcome. Thank you, Reverend Katie Lee. So glad to have you with us this morning. Today, our pianist Yukiko Takagi has brought us three pieces by the French composer Maurice Ravel. Our prelude, offertory, and postlude are three movements of Ravel's sonatine respectively. This first movement, Modère or Moderate, was written for a competition, although Ravel sent it in under a pseudonym. We invite you to enjoy the sound of its rich melodies and harmonies as Yukiko wakes up our sanctuary's piano from its long winter's nap. Thank you, Yukiko.
Thank you, Yukiko. What a delight to get to hear the sound of the piano actually echoing from the space it was made to be in. This is my first Sunday in the pulpit as your interim minister, so it's very exciting. This service today honors the Christian season of Advent, which spans these four Sundays leading up to Christmas. We enter into our time of worship today with these words from Unitarian Universalist Minister, Reverend Erica Hewitt. This is the season of endings and beginnings, when the small signs of dawn pierce through the night and something new is born. But first comes the waiting. First come the lessons of endings and beginnings. The presence of life, the sheltering spirit of love, grieves with those sweeping up the debris of loss, waits with those who restlessly reach out for change, grants us courage in the night to guard each other's dreams for this holy, wondrous universe. Grant us, O oh universe unfolding in mystery, a sense of your timing. May we loosen our grip on that which doesn't serve us, leaving behind that which we have outworn and outgrown. Teach us the lessons of beginnings. Remind us that such waitings and endings may be a starting place, a planting of seeds which bring to birth what is ready to be born, something right and just and different a new song, a deeper relationship, a fuller love in the fullness of time. Welcome to worship. Our opening hymn is the joyous Advent song, People Look East. Its lyrics were composed by Eleanor Fargion, a British author best known for writing the hymn, Morning Has Broken. She wrote People Look East in the 1920s, set to the tune of a French carol. We're urged to look east in the direction of the rising sun, which from both England and here in the United States is also the direction of Bethlehem. Let's join together in singing this song of anticipation of love's arrival in our world. Over to Michael and Yukiko. People look east, the time is near of the crowning of the year. Make your house fair as you are able. Trim the hearth and set the table. People look east and sing today. Love the guest is on the way. Furrows be glad, though earth is bare. One more seed is planted there. Give up your strength, the seed to nourish. Knit in course, the flower may flourish. People look east and sing today. Love the rose is on the way. Stars keep the watch when night is dim. One more light the bowl shall brim. Shining beyond the frosty weather. Bright as sun and moon together. People look east and sing today. Love the star is on the way. Beautiful. We kindle two sets of lights today, our flaming chalice and then an advent wreath. We light our flaming chalice, the symbol of Unitarian Universalism, with words that Meredith St. John and Karen Kirchhoff will lead us in reading. These will appear in your chat 
first in English and then in Spanish, which we say in honor of our sister community in Plazuelas, El Salvador. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its prayer. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. El amor es el espíritu de esta iglesia y el servicio es nuestra oración. Esta es nuestra gran promesa, vivir juntos en paz, buscar la verdad con amor y ayudarnos los unos a las otras. Amen. Thank you. And we kindle three candles on our Advent wreath, a ritual that many Christian communities practice to count the weeks leading up to Christmas. Candles representing hope, love, joy, and peace. This is the third Sunday in Advent when we light the pink candle for joy. Thank you. And Rose has a story for all ages for us today about Advent. Thank you so much. Get used to telling a story from here, not just screen up. It's really a joy to be with you all this morning in this new way. So our story this morning is an excerpt from All Creation Waits the advent mystery of new beginnings by christian author gail boss in this beautiful book of meditations one for each day of advent the author reflects on how 25 different animals from a painted turtle to a wild turkey to a red fox experience the time of year that we are now in when nights are growing longer and longer, and we all must adapt to living largely in darkness. The author sees the season around our winter solstice, a time when this growing darkness pulls us towards stillness, introspection, and waiting as the natural basis for the Christian season of Advent which is a reverent time of waiting in the Christian calendar as we await the celebration of Jesus's birth at Christmas. So I'll be sharing an adapted excerpt from the introduction to All Creation Waits. This passage starts with Gail Boss describing her personal journey to reconnect with the Advent season when she was a new mother. She writes, in reading about this tradition, I learned that the roots of Advent run deep beneath the Christian church, in the earth and its seasons. In late autumn in the Northern hemisphere, brings the end of the growing season for our agriculturally rooted ancestors. This was a time of huge transition with their storerooms finally full from the fall harvest, the group body called out feast. At the same time, no matter how glad the party, our ancestors couldn't help but glance at the sky. Each day throughout the fall, they watched the light dwindle, felt the warmth weaken. It made them anxious, edgy. Their fires were no substitute for the sun. Throughout December, as the sun sank and sank to its lowest point on the horizon, they felt the shadow of primal fear, fear for survival crouching over them. They were feasting, yes, but they were fearful both. Yes, last year, the sun had returned to their sky. But what if this year it didn't? 
despite their collective memory, people wedded bodily to the earth couldn't help but ask that question. Their bodies in the present tense ask that question. Our bodies still ask that question. In December, the dark and cold deepen and our rational minds dismiss it as nothing. We know that on December 21st, the winter solstice, the sun will begin its return to the sky. But our animal bodies react with disease. We feel the light, life is going. For us also, as for our ancestors, the dark end of the year brings unrest. It is an end. It comes without our asking and makes plain how little of life's course we control. This uncertainty, we don't know how to mark. And so it marks us. We feel weighted, gloomy even, and we may also feel guilty because voices of our modern culture in myriad ways sing out, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Learning about the spiritual tradition of Advent told me that my own annual December sadness was no reason for guilt. It was a sign of being wide awake in the world, awake enough to sense loss. And furthermore, there was a way to engage that sadness within the Christian tradition. That way was Advent. Advent to the church fathers was the right naming of the season when light and life are fading. They urged the faithful to set aside four weeks to fast, give, and pray, always to strip down, to let the bared soul recall what it knows beneath its sphere of the dark, to know what Jesus called the one necessary thing that there is one who is the source of all life, one who comes to be with us and, is, and with us and in us, even especially in darkness and death, one who brings a new beginning. The author then describes how this understanding, this natural basis for the Advent season has called her to turn even more towards the natural world at this time of year to try to learn how our animal kin in particular respond to the reality of winter she writes animals can show us how a healthy soul responds to encroaching darkness and there's more than one response there's the turtle response, the loon response, the black bear's response. When that primal fear of the dark, of the end, begins to slide over us, animals unselfconsciously and forthrightly offer unfearful responses. They take in the threat of dark and cold, and they adapt in amazing and ingenious ways. They shape themselves to life as it is given. The practice of Advent has always been about helping us to grasp the mystery of new beginning out of what looks like death. Other than human creatures sprung like us from the source of life, manifest this mystery without question or doubt the natural world can be to us a book about God, a word of God, the God who comes even in the darkest season to bring us a new beginning. This Advent season that we are marking together, may we learn, may we learn from the world around us, give in to what the darkness in our animal bodies are telling us is true. May we be with the stillness, 
with the reverent waiting for a new beginning that these darkest of days call us into. Thank you, Rose. We center our hearts with another Advent classic hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. This carol finds its origins as early as the ninth century as a lush Latin text that was turned into an English set of lyrics in the 19th century by John Mason Neal, and then set to an 11th century Franciscan plain song chant. So it really comes from all over. Our Unitarian Universalist hymnal uses rewritten lyrics. And my colleague, Reverend Kimberly Davis, describes it this way. Our version of this hymn expands the scope beyond the children of Israel to all people grounded in the unitary, uh, sorry, in the universalist understanding that hope and salvation is for all souls and that the appearance of a Messiah would bring broader help and healing to us all. In that spirit of hope and expectant waiting, let's sing together. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and with your captive children dwell. Give comfort to all exiles here, and to the aching heart be cheer. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come within as love to dwell. Oh, come, you splendor, very bright, as joy that never yields to might. Oh, come and turn all hearts. That greed and war at last shall cease. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come within as truth to dwell. Oh, come you day spring spirits by your presence and on in every broken soul as vision that can see the whole rejoice rejoice Emmanuel shall come as light to dwell. Oh, come you wisdom from on high, from depths that hide within a sigh, to temper knowledge with our care. Generosity is a spiritual practice in our Unitarian Universalist congregations. 
we give to remind ourselves of how many gifts we have to offer. We give to remember that there, we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. We give because we believe in music and sacred space. We give with the faith that together we have enough. Links to donate will be in our chat, or you can take a meditative moment and write out a check and send it to the church. And those of us present may offer our own gift. An offering to sustain this congregation of memory and hope will now be gratefully received. Thank you. Friends, thank you for your generosity. Yukiko, thank you for your music. I invite you to join me in a time of meditation and prayer, first in words and in shared silence and in meditative music from Michael. Our prayer today is from Cole Arthur Riley from the Black Liturgies Project. God of the long and aching wait, this year has swelled with the grief and loss and longing of many. We want so much more than the present condition of this world. Where are you? There are seasons when it becomes difficult to believe in your nearness. Would you make it known to us now? that as we carry each other through this season, we would find miracle in the mundane, tiny sacred flashes of good as we wait for a healing that lasts. Help us to dream that we would find even our prayers grow grown large in this season, 
asking for those things which we have marked off as foolish or naive. Help us to dream not that we would pine for some mirage of how things used to be, but that we would hold space for visions of life and societies where justice can breathe, where power is mobile, and where liberation leaves no soul behind. Come, Holy One, and we will wait. Let us be together in sacred silence. So may it be, and amen. I now invite Reverend Katie Lee to give us a reading for this morning. Today's reading is by Robin Tanner, <clears throat> called A Holy Impatience. Robin Tanner serves our UU congregation in Sanu, New Jersey. Here is how she describes a holy impatience. Shortly after his birth and several times in the first years of his life, my son Benjamin was hospitalized for breathing difficulties. Happily, he is now a robust two and a half year old. Before the pandemic, we sent him back to daycare it was a big decision informed by a pediatric pulmonologist that his lungs were strong enough to withstand the germs. In those first weeks, Benjamin would come home delighted after seeing other children. But at night, I would creep into his room while he slept in order to listen to his breathing. After three weeks of this, I finally realized I was waiting for him to get sick again. I was exhausted. Reentry is hard. Even in the presence of all things longed for and hoped for, reentry is hard. This year, the Advent season seems particularly seized by a spirit of the unexpected longing. The waiting is a mixture of dread and hope. On the one hand, I turn to the horizon and long for a day without masks, when with face to face with humanity once more. But on the other hand, as winter deepens, I seize up for a second swell of this deadly virus. I listen to Benjamin's breathing and my own heartbeat pumping in my ears. And still, hark the herald angels sing. We're called once more to a holy impatience and presence to live with an unquenched longing for the world as it can yet be, 
while also discovering the bits of the world that are already unfolding in our midst. The child is not yet here, yet the spirit of that child, the dreams for that child and the story have already been written into our hearts. We are in a time of readying for joy even as injustice and suffering are woven into each day. Perhaps this is hope, a holy impatience at its most elemental and embodied form, which dares to dream while fiercely loving the world today. This morning, Benjamin shouted as I went to walk out the door, wait, honey, a story for another day, hug. It was enough and it will never be enough. Gracious God, help us to be ready for when the joy comes back. Allow us to re-enter this world with a holy impatience born of the longing for the world that can be and holding the child already in our midst. Holy one, let me be a human of the lavish expectations and practical courage. Let me be one who allows love to hold me on the hardest days. Thank you. How are you with waiting? In line at the grocery store, waiting for an appointment or for a repair technician to show up between 12 and 4, or for a back ordered part to arrive from an audio visual system, waiting for a special day on a calendar like the birth of a child. How does it feel to be watching the clock, counting down the days, getting closer to the thing? Maybe we feel impatient, excited, distracted, or we might be planning or biding our time. And what about waiting for those indefinite things when we don't have something concrete upon which to set our sights or count down to? Like when the flight is delayed and you're hanging around the airport terminal, restlessly waiting for more information. We don't have to think back too far, I would guess, to know how it feels to be waiting with no clear end in sight that might feel like status quo. With nearly two years now of COVID, the feelings of restlessness, fatigue, resignation, burnout, and anger are probably pretty fresh. And now this December, we're facing another surge in case numbers, which calls us to be extra vigilant in our precautions it's a lot. Free entry can be hard. Perhaps it can be helpful then that we get to practice the spiritual discipline of purposeful, meaningful waiting during this season of Advent. This is the time in the Christian calendar for counting down to the birth of Jesus at Christmas, a season of expectation heightened by the lighting of the advent wreath or with advent calendars that may be dispensed chocolate for each day. <laughs> the word advent comes from the Latin word adventus, which can be translated as toward the thing that is coming or a thing about to happen. As we experience waiting during the pandemic, 
let's look to both secular and sacred wisdom to try and make the waiting better. Here are three practices to help us wait well. Practice one, make waiting interesting. There's a story that architects and urban designers tell about how people stopped complaining so much about waiting for elevators in the skyscrapers of New York City. The story's origins are in the post Second World War building boom with its massive increase of skyscrapers. One building's manager brought in mechanical engineers and elevator companies to help him solve a daily problem. People were waiting too long for the elevators and they were getting angry about it. After exploring the issue, the engineers and company representatives came back and said that the problem was unsolvable. But a psychologist who worked in that building came up with his own solution. According to one version of the story, the psychologist didn't focus on elevator performance, but on the fact that people felt frustrated with what was a relatively short wait. He concluded that the frustration was likely due to boredom. With the approval of the building's manager, he put up mirrors around the elevator waiting area so that people could look at themselves and at others waiting. Thus, waiting became interesting. The complaints not only ceased immediately and completely, but some previous complainers actually applauded the building staff for improving the speed of the elevator service. <laughs> I love this story because it reminds us of what's possible with a shift in perspective from restless and bored to interested and appreciative. What have you found during this time that has sparked your interest? What might this waiting time give you the chance to focus on? Are there crafts, hobbies, or passion projects or relationships to engage with? Perhaps specific friendships you want to cultivate? Practice two, remember why we are waiting. Jason Farman, a professor who studies waiting, invites us to ask, who benefits from my waiting? It is so natural for us to perceive waiting as imposed upon us and see it either as an inconvenience or as removing our ability to control our own time. But here's another shift. We can shift from feeling powerless and irritated to empowered and purposeful by remembering why we are waiting. With COVID cases spiking across the nation, including here in Boston, with the Delta and Omicron variants now at play, it's vital that we practice all of the precautions we've got in our toolkit. You should know them pretty well by now. Being cautious about large group gatherings, wearing masks when we're near others, keeping up our compassionate distance from people outside of our pods, and following the guidance of our public health professionals. So let's make it a conscious choice, remembering who it is that we are trying to protect. Here's the invitation. When you start feeling antsy or angry or thinking about getting lax on some of the protocols that have just felt so tiresome, try this. Make an actual list of the people in your life that you're doing all of this to protect. A family member in assisted living, a loved one with asthma, an elder whose health is frail, a niece who is still too young to get vaccinated, a friend with cancer whose immune system is compromised, write down their names or put their pictures on your fridge. 
When waiting feels hard, look at their names or their faces and pray for them or say the loving kindness meditation. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. And may you be happy. And practice three, get clear on what we hope for on the other side of this. This takes us back to the sacred waiting of the Advent season. For Christians, Advent is also about an expectant waiting for the coming of the kingdom of God. This is often understood as a time when, through God's rule, the world will be transformed into a kind of heaven on earth. Or, as feminist theologian Ada Maria Isasi Diaz described it, a kingdom, K I N, dom of God, envisioning a liberated world where all humanity understands itself as family. Our gathering song, The Canticle of the Turning, expresses that eager yearning for tyrants to be vanquished, for the hungry to be fed, for justice, for the world is about to turn. I still carry a hope that the disruption of this pandemic gives us the chance to envision not going back to life as usual, but onward to something better. So what is your vision of a better world? What would heaven on earth look like, feel like? How would we know that we have achieved it? Get specific. Hold on to that vision of what could be. And when the waiting gets hard, take one small action to help us move toward it. As the Indian novelist Arundhati Roy says, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. Mm -hmm. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Beloveds, we are in a season of waiting. Let's use this time to wait well. Let's make the waiting interesting. Remember why we're waiting and who we're protecting and keep our sights set on building a heaven on earth for the world is about to turn. So may it be. Our closing hymn is a song about that hope and a vision for that better future. How oh, can I keep from singing, or as it's listed in our hymnal, my life flows on in endless song. It was originally written as a hymn by American Baptist minister Robert Lowry, though it's since become a beloved folk song and was adopted by the Quakers especially. The third verse that we sing about tyrants trembling, we got from Doris Plen, who learned the original hymn from her grandmother and was taught that this verse dated from the early days of the Quaker movement. This song was made famous by the late, great UU folk singer, Pete Seeger, including that special third verse. Let's join together in singing. My life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentation. I hear the real, though far off him, that hails a new creation. Through all the tumult and the strife, I hear the music ringing, it sounds an echo in my soul, how can I keep from singing? 
What the, though the tempest round me roars, I know the truth it liveth. What though the darkness round me close, songs in the night it giveth. No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging. Since love prevails in heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? When tyrants tremble as they hear, the bells of freedom ringing when, when friends rejoice both far and near how can i keep from singing to prison cell and dungeon vile our thoughts to them are winging when friends by shame are undefined, how can I keep from singing? Thank you, Michael and you, Kiko. Following our postlude, which is the third movement of Ravel's Sona team, we'll have a few brief announcements about our upcoming services and then a time for connection in breakout rooms. So we hope you'll stick around for a few more minutes. Our closing words today are from Reverend Sarah Moores Campbell. We receive fragments of holiness, glimpses of eternity, brief moments of insight. Let us gather them up for the precious gifts that they are and renewed by their grace, move boldly into the unknown. So may it be an amen. Mm -hmm.